Hello, class. Well, if you're the class, I guess that must mean you are classy people. <laughs> so welcome, classy people. Good to see you on the, well, I can't see you. Uh, sorry, it may look like I can see you, but I really can't see you. <laughs> and like I said before, it's the weirdest thing sitting here talking to yourself. Are you like me? Like when you do a Zoom meeting with people, you kind of look over their shoulder to see what it, you know, hey, what's their house look like? <laughs> you know, we, we see this guy at church. What What's it look like at his house? So, yeah, you get to see a little bit behind me there uh, of what our house looks like and how wonderful a job my wife does with decorating and getting things festive, at least ready for the Thanksgiving season. Uh, Thanksgiving, which will take place nine days from now, because you know, usually I do these things out in a, a, a little room that we have in the backyard, but if I was out there right now, it, let's see, it's 36 degrees, so I would be freezing, and actually looking out there, we're having our first snowfall, so it's Tuesday, November 17th, and so we're having our first so fall. So here we are, we're inside, and we're going to get through grab bag number seven. There we go. That's my introduction, grab bag number seven. And remember, if you would, to please punch, I guess, down below here, there's something that you can hit to show that you are in attendance, and if you would do that, we would greatly appreciate that, to have a record of the fact uh, that you attended. We'd like to know how many people are using this opportunity for communication, okay? So the, we're in a series, I, I guess it's become a series. I actually began thinking that, okay, we might end up with two, but now it's going into three and it could really go, uh, into four. So this would be like the second part of the series, and I know it's going to go into next week, and next week's the last one, so I guess it'll only be three. It could go into four, but uh, we're looking at the life of Isaac in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, and when we laughed, when we laughed, when we last left, Jacob, our spiritual tree relative from way back, he and his mom, Rebecca, had just deceived his dad, Isaac, into giving the fatherly blessing to him rather than his big brother, Esau. Now I'm thinking, uh-oh, I think I said we're doing a study on Jacob. If I said that, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I'm not going back. We're doing a study on Isaac, okay? Uh, no, we're not. We're doing a study on Jacob. I do this, you see, just to confuse you, just to keep you awake. So we're doing a study on Jacob, who is the son of Isaac, as is his brother Esau. Anyway, um, <laughs> if you remember, Jacob had uh, tricked his dad Isaac into giving the fatherly blessing to Jacob rather than his big brother Esau, uh, the, the birthright, you know. So this really, anyway, this deception of, this deception of Jacob's really set Esau on fire emotionally, and he vowed to kill his brother. And you can find that in Genesis 27, verses 41 through 46. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And he said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near, and then I will kill my brother Jacob. Well, upon hearing that news, Esau was obviously very loud about it. Rebecca got her favorite son ready to go on a trip to her homeland, and she sent him on his way to his uncle Laban's neighborhood in Padan Aram. Okay, 
So Jacob tricks Esau out of his birthright. And then he tricks him also out of a blessing from Father Isaac. He deceives him. And he does that with the help of his mother, Rebecca. Remember, the Bible says that Isaac loved Esau. Rebecca loved Jacob. And so Jacob is the favored son of Rebecca. Well, after they together conspire to deceive Isaac, Esau is just lit up. I mean, he is just on fire with anger. And he obviously just spews it out, says it out loud, that eventually when Isaac dies, he, is go he meaning um, Esau, is going to kill his twin brother, Jacob. But mommy dearest, who loves Jacob, overhears it. And so she comes up with a plan to send Jacob away to her hometown. And we read in verse 42 of Genesis 27, when Rebecca, oh no, Gen, well, I didn't write down the chapter. I don't have right in front of me. Here I, I just made an, a really big mistake. It may be chapter 28. When Rebecca was told what her older son Esau had said, she sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, your brother Esau is planning to avenge himself. Another translation says that he is consoling himself by making plans to kill you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. Notice she uses a descriptive word in English. The word is fury. Not anger, but fury. I mean, fury is a couple or more ticks up on the anger meter. Maybe right below the word rage. So co-conspirator Rebecca then makes a promise to her son. She says, when your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, I'll send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? Now, did you hear that question? She says, why should I lose both of you in one day? Either she has already lost Esau emotionally as her son, which I believe she had, or she is saying that when Esau would kill Jacob, then she would eventually have nothing to do with Esau. So either way, what she's saying is, I've lost Esau, or I'm going to lose Esau, and then I'm going to lose you because he's going to kill you. So why should I lose both? It's a sad, sad question that a mom should think, I've already lost one son. Why should I lose the other one? I really believe that her motherly betrayal had severed, hopefully not permanently, her relationship with her oldest son, Esau. So like I said, therefore she will lose one boy physically while she has already lost one relationally or will lose one relationally. It makes you wonder which is worse, dead and gone or alive and gone? I mean, it, which, which is going to hurt her worse? For Jacob to be dead and gone, killed by her brother, or to be alive and gone? Either way, she loses. And this is the point at which Rebecca becomes <laughs> a drama queen. And she decides to lie to deceive Isaac once again. She says, she goes to Isaac and she says, 
I'm disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. Remember, Esau had married Hittite women outside the uh, family line, outside the clan, the, the, the tribe, outside the Jewish line. And she said, if Jacob takes a wife from among the women of this land, from Hittite women like these, my life will not be worth living. Oh, my life will not be worth living. She obviously had some contention between Esau's non-Jewish wives. And so she, she makes up this situation and she goes to Isaac and she simply says, oh no, if Jacob did the same thing, why would she think he would do the same thing? But if he does the same thing, oh my life, just won't be worth living. So now the groundwork has been laid for Isaac to agree to his youngest son's exit from the family nest. You know, one question I have is, is Isaac, I mean, is he oblivious to what's going on around him? Is he like off in a corner in the tent somewhere? Is he so dense or is he just growing dim in his older age? I mean, he's approximately 150 to 160 years old at this time. But that doesn't mean that Rebecca is a spring chicken either. Anyway, Isaac becomes convinced that, yeah, Jacob needs to go back to Haran and uh, so he sends him away with a blessing, and Jacob goes on his merry way, and he's heading off to Haran. I, I wonder how they were able to travel such long distances without GPS to guide them. I guess they were just that good at following the stars and, and knowing the direction. 457 miles, says one source, about 50 miles less than the distance from Pittsburgh to New York City. Another source says 690 miles. So anyway, somewhere between 450 and 700 miles. I, I guess it depends on what trade route you went, what direction you went. And so Jacob is off to Haran. Now the first step, stop that we know about for Jacob is at a rest stop. <laughs> It's a, it's, he's a stops at Bethel, which was a 90-mile trip. And this will be our final stop for this lesson, because we're going to, if you pardon the pun, we're going to camp here for a bit. In Genesis chapter 28, verse 10, we read, Jacob left Beersheba, which, you know, we say Beersheba, which... I think the pronunciation correctly is Beersheba. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. And taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. <laughs> you think about that. I mean, you have to be absolutely dead tired to sleep on a rock. Did Jacob leave home in such a hurry that he left without his favorite pillow? <laughs> um, I would hope he was smart enough to put a covering on the stone for a cushion. But not only would he have been tired, he may have been very hungry as well. Not being as efficient a hunter as his brother Esau, you know, he was a great cook, we learned. But you're not going to be a great cook if you don't have anything, any food to cook. So in the words of Indiana Jones, it's not the years, it's the mileage. And so a worn out and possibly tired Jacob sleeps on a rock. And he sleeps like a rock, I guess. And he dreams. In verse 12, he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there above it stood the Lord, and he said, 
I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. In this amazing dream, God identifies himself. Plus, he will give Jacob a lesson in the spiritual family tree. Because he says, I am the Lord. But then he says, I am the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I mean, what that says to Jacob, if anything, is this God has been around a while. This God knows people. And this God knows what's going on on earth. He may be in heaven, but he's fully aware of what's been going on on the earth. And it makes me wonder if God is hinting to Jacob and subtly asking, so who's next? And I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of your father Isaac. So who's next in line? Or now I'm waiting for you, Jacob, to let me move into your world. To your, I was in the world of your grandfather. I was in the life and world of your grandfather. I was in the life and world of your father. Well, now, Jacob, let me move into your life and your world. You may recall from our first lesson that Jacob had said to his father, when, when Isaac asked, well, how did you find this meat so quickly? You know, he sent Esau off to, to go hunt and, and then to bring him uh, game from the field that he enjoyed. And while Esau's gone, you know, Jacob, through Rebekah's deceptional leading, steps in. And Isaac at least had the wherewithal to say, how did that happen so quickly? And Jacob lied and said, you listen, your God gave me success in finding the wild game. That makes me think that Jacob really did not claim a personal relationship with God. And so if he didn't, that would make greed and jealousy and conniving to get his brother's privileges even more of an okay course of action. I mean, if there's no God, there's no moral principle to follow. Get what you can. That, that's the way a lot of people live in our world today. They've jettisoned God. God doesn't exist. And if God isn't there, then who's to say what's right and wrong? And so I can do anything that I want to get what I want. And if it means lying, if it means deceiving, and yeah, I'll do it. And maybe, you know, Jacob just kind of reflected the humanistic person of today. It's okay for me to lie. It's okay for me to be greedy. It's okay for me to have jealousy. It's okay for me to deceive and to connive to get my brother's privileges because there's no moral framework that obligates me to God. I, I don't know if Jacob thought that. We don't have that in the scripture. But it's sure something to think about. Now God, we find, is polite. Polite enough to introduce himself in a personal way. I am the Lord, your God. Um, you know, which is, again... He, I'm sorry, he doesn't say, I am the Lord, your God. He just says, I am the Lord. I am the God of your father, Abraham. And I. He introduces himself in a very personal way. He doesn't simply say, you know, Jacob, I am God, the creator God. I am the mighty force over everything. He doesn't come off that way, but he simply introduces himself as, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac. Even though the ground on which Jacob is wandering and traveling, 
belongs to the one who made it. God doesn't come off like, you better obey me or boom. He seemed to approach Jacob with some compassion and some understanding. God is polite with Jacob as he is with each of us. Polite by making himself known, but then allowing Jacob room to make his own decision about God. And that's the way God is with us. God will not impose himself. He will not force himself on anyone. But he is difficult to resist. He will be persistent. He has been called in literature the hound of heaven. <laughs> because God, he'll just keep coming and keep coming. God, out of grace, then makes a promise to Jacob following this dream. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. What? That's quite a promise. I mean, Jacob is on his way. He's wandering. He's going back to Haran. But God is saying, look, I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. And we're, we find out later on he does. He brings him back to Bethel, where this promise is made. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. How magnanimous and how gracious is God, especially after the sin of Jacob. The fruit of this promise that God makes will take over 20 years to ripen for Jacob. And it is still being honored in history today. Here we are seeing the creator God at work planting the seeds of a nation. We are reading about God's embryonic formation of the nation of Israel. Well, if Jacob is thinking after he wakes up, even though he is wandering northward in the night away from his security and his family, he can't help but be aware that God knows all about him. God knows all about Jacob, and he's not allowing Jacob to run from God like he did from his family. Jacob is on the lamb, but Jacob and we will learn that God is with him and will be faithful to him, keeping his promise through the stolen blessing. That's amazing. Through the stolen blessing, God is still going to act and God is going to keep his promise. The unchanging God is still the same to us. We may find that amazing, but it should be amazing even to us. That God is faithful, that he's never going to leave or forsake us, that he's working for our benefit, even though we are sinners. As unchanging as God is the grace that he offers Jacob and he offers us. Notice that God reiterates to Jacob the promise that had been made originally to Abraham and Isaac. He tells Jacob that he will honor his promise through Jacob, even though he is a thief. <laughs> you know, I will give you this land. You will have descendants as plentiful as the dust. You know, that's what somebody said. I, I don't dust because either somebody's coming or going, one or the other. <laughs> you know, how much dust is there? 
you're going to have descendants as plentiful as the dust and all the nations will be blessed through you. What a promise. God is reiterating the promise that he gave to Abraham and Isaac and stating it for the ears of Jacob. And I want you to notice, if you will, the latter part of verse 14 that I already mentioned to you, where God says, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. With these words, God is stating his plan for the nation of Israel. They are meant to be an evangelistic nation, a nation of priests meant to bring a blessing to all nations by allowing God's purpose and character and glory to be displayed through them. The same expectation will be repeated to the newly born nation of Israel, and we'll find it in the book of Exodus. Chapter 19, beginning with verse 3, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of, guess who? Jacob. So we're going to see that eventually Jacob does, pardon the casual language, but Jacob does hook up with God. So this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. Quote, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, conditional, if you obey me fully, if you keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. God says that the nation of Israel would be a kingdom of priests. In other words, they would be intercessors and a holy nation. In other words, a nation set aside for God's purposes. Now remember these words and compare them to 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Ding, 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 ding. Did that all that ring a bell for you? God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You see, Israel was commissioned to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, they failed their pur purpose for the most part, and they took God's favor as favoritism, exclusive of everyone else. Eventually, we know they missed the Messiah, who came to be the way for all nations to come to God, not just a way for Israel. Well, Jesus established the church. And Peter, you know, we don't believe in uh, the papacy, etc., but God chose Peter, and he gave him a special promise. And Peter, maybe in a sense, is like Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. Because Peter, a Jew of God's holy people, in writing to the church in the first century, transfers the commission from the old Israel to the church, which is the new Israel. As a member of the church, through the blood of Christ, not just as names on a church roll, 
you and I are part of the kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You see, that's what Peter was saying. You know, if you were a Jew in the first century and you're reading what Peter wrote, that you are a holy nation, that you are a kingdom of priests, that you are a people for God's own possession, that you are called to tell other nations and other people about the grace of God that calls them out of darkness and leads them into a kingdom of light. If you were a Jew in the first century, you would be thinking, wait a second, that's who the nation of Israel was meant to be. And now, as a follower of Christ, as a member of the church, that's who I am. That's who I'm supposed to be. That's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to be a priest, an intercessor for other people to lead them to Jesus. I'm supposed to be a holy person, part of a holy nation, set aside for God and for his purposes. I am supposed to proclaim the excellencies of this God who called me out of darkness into his marvelous light so that other people can also experience the same. Just as the nation of Israel in the Old Testament was to be evangelistic, so the church, the new Israel in the New Testament, is to be evangelistic. And the problem, the danger, is that like the Old Testament Israel, we take God's favorite, his favor toward us, and turn it into favoritism, that God only likes us, that God only loves us. And as long as we have God, then we don't have to worry about all of those other people. And if we worry about them, they're gonna just come in and ruin everything. They're gonna taint our nation. So it became a negative mindset for the Old Testament nation of Israel, we really have to guard against that as the body of Christ in our day. And sometimes we do nothing because we have a negative attitude toward people, but sometimes we do nothing just because we do nothing. And either one of those Bad attitude, nothing, or nothing, nothing. <laughs> Both of those were sinful. They will stop dead in its tracks the purpose of God, which is to make disciples of all nations. There is a danger that will mistake God's favor for favoritism and not invite others in or tell others. Well, that's just one lesson. I kind of sat there for a little bit. I camped on the camp, I guess. Um, but, but Jacob had a dream of a ladder connecting earth and heaven. And we're climbing a stairway to him. Some of you are old enough to remember that song. Anyway, that, I don't know what that, anyway. But that picture of a ladder between heaven and earth is the whole idea of God being accessible. And one day, one greater than the angels, according to the book of Hebrews, would come. And he would be the way to the Father. He would be the stairway to heaven. And we know that he did come, right? In another month, we'll celebrate all over again, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus came, revealing the Father. But there at Bethel, <clears throat> Jacob makes a significant promise of his own to God. God makes a promise to Jacob, and Jacob makes a promise in return. In verse 20, 
Jacob made a vow saying, and again, conditional, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household. Then, <laughs> so Jacob, he, he kind of makes this conditional promise to God. Look, if God, if you, if you will be with me, if you will watch over me on this journey, that doesn't, God said he would, but like I said, Jacob is not hooked into a relationship with God. I mean, he doesn't trust God. Jacob himself is, is a guy who thinks that I get everything by my own devious wiles. I can, I can get what I want. And maybe he just doesn't trust people because he's lived his life in a family of deceivers. And so he says, okay, if you will be with me, if you'll watch over me in the journey that I'm taking, and if you give me food to eat and clothes to wear, right? You supply my basic needs, God, so that I return safely to my father's household. Is there, is there any more? Can you add any more on Jacob? Well, he says, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Jacob makes a deal with God. <laughs> You'll be with me. You watch over me. You give me food to eat. If you clothe me and if you bring me back. Okay, God. Then I'll acknowledge you. I'll make room for you in my life. And not only that, I'll give you a tithe. I'll give you a tenth of everything you give me. How's he going to keep track of that? I mean, he could keep track of the food and the clothes. But there is no way that. I'm looking out this window and they're sitting on a branch is a hawk. Those are the things. How's he going to keep track of the beauty that will surround him? How does he keep track and give God back a tenth of every breath that he's breathed? <laughs> Boy, sometimes we are just so, so silly as human beings. It seems that Jacob, again, has made no significant commitment to God personally. But he promises to make, if God will meet his conditions, some kind of a deal. Such amazing insolence in the face of the Creator. But don't we sometimes do the same thing? I mean, we know what God says, and yet we choose to sin on purpose. We get angry at God and deliberately sin like a tantrum-throwing, spoiled child daring his parents to just do something. Go ahead. But God, who could wipe us all out with a flick of his wrist or a end of a fingertip remains forgiving and patient. He even allows discipline in order to grow us. You know, when we get insolent or whatever and, and sin, God disciplines us, but it's not, he disciplines us in order to grow us. That's how much God loves us. It'll be 20 to 21 years later that God will keep his word and tell Jacob to go home. <laughs> you know, God says, I will bring you back. And 20, 21 years later, the word comes to Jacob, okay, it's time for you to go home. The question will be, will Jacob keep his end of the bargain? After 21 years, will he give in to God? Well, we've already got, spoiler alert, 
we already kind of know that he does. But it's interesting how even that comes about, and we'll look at that in our next lesson. It's amazing that God is patient, allowing Jacob to state the terms of the deal, and then allowing Jacob to run out his string like a yo-yo before God yanks it back and leads Jacob to a place of surrender. So here's a few final lessons. First of all, favoritism and deception in a family can make trusting God very difficult for children. I mean, it's Jacob's choice. But when you're raised in a family where there's deception and favoritism, it becomes very difficult for a child to trust God. Second lesson. I don't recommend trying to broker deals with God to get what you want. <laughs> you know, I, uh, there was a, oh, I can't think of his name, but uh, an old movie where a guy was, it was a comedy. Anyway, he was out in the water and he kept making a promise, God, if you get me in, I'm all good. And the closer he got to shore, the less and less became terms of the promise. You know, people try to broker deals with God, but don't do that. Submit instead to God and obey his will. The third lesson, Jacob has a concept of tithing that he promises to begin if God meets his qualifications. Is that an attempt to bribe God? I mean, what do you think? You know, I'll give you a tenth of everything. Is he trying to bribe God with that? Well, has God been faithful and good to you? If so, are you tithing? Now, what does 10% of everything look like with what you have? It's a joke, you know. Do you, do you tithe 10% on the net? Or do you tithe 10% on the entire income or whatever you have? You know, um, the gross. Well, are we going to be that picky? Has God been faithful to you? If so, are you tithing? It's a biblical principle, tithing, as a bare minimum, 10% of everything. And then offerings on top of that. You will never, as they say, you will never outgive God. You could, you could give all of your income from now until the day that you die. And you will never, never outdo God for the blessings he has already given you to this very point. When you start looking at things that are beyond just income. What does 10% of everything look like with what you have? Will you tithe? I hope so. At least tithe. Next lesson. Jacob had to get away from certain influencers and get a loan it seems, for God to get Jacob's full attention. He had to experience life alone and lonely in a makeshift camp while running for his life in a strange territory. Out there alone in the dark, there was no one else to rely on. Mommy wasn't around, but neither was daddy, neither was big brother Esau, who was strong and a great hunter. There was no one out there to defraud. But there was God. And sometimes we have to force ourselves to get alone in order to spend time with God. Sometimes God brings us to a point of being alone. And yes, even feeling a little lonely. Because he wants us to look up and look to him. It's just sometimes the only way that God can get our full attention. More than just from his dream, Jacob is beginning 
to wake up. In verse 16, we read, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. There is, this is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And so early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, Beth-el, though the city used to be called Luz. Oil is for anointing. I, I take this to mean that Jacob is beginning a life of worship of God. And he sees this place as an anointed meeting with God. God can see his heart. And God will wait as Jacob tests God and grows in faith over the next 20 years. A lot of people have come to the ends of their ropes, or more accurately, the ends of themselves, before they turn their eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. There is a song, a Christian song I heard that has this line, I found life in the death of me. People have to die before they resurrect. That was Jacob. And in the next lesson, we will see that in a very real way, Jacob will die to himself and become all gods. There are a lot of people, maybe even religious people or church people, who never have a true experience with God. They may even come to church and not realize that God is in the room. They may be raised in a Christian family and not know the God of their parents, just like Jacob. And perhaps one day they will wake up and like Jacob, they'll say, the God was in this place and I didn't even know it. But what about you? It's not always somebody else, but what about you? Do you live with an awareness of God who is in all and through all? Are you living mindful of God's presence so that you know without a doubt that in him you live, move, breathe, and have your being. Jacob spoke, as we already mentioned, some of the saddest words that were probably ever spoken, some of the saddest words that were ever written in the Bible. The Lord was in this place, and I was not aware of it. I was totally unaware Unfortunately, uh, many people are going to stand one day before the Lord and suddenly realize just how blind they were to the author of life. Whose fault will that be? Will they have heard the gospel? Will they have heard because we told them, or will they not have heard? because we didn't follow through in being people of a holy nation, a royal priesthood, proclaiming the excellencies of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so I'll close with this reminder. We are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people for God's possession. Why? I have one purpose, and that is to proclaim the excellencies of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, this faith is about more than just you and me making it into heaven, to getting a ticket for the gospel train, and then just sitting down in our seat and waiting through the ride. God's purpose is totally dependent on you and me. So let's, let's be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Let's be a people that proclaims the excellencies 
the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Otherwise, <laughs> why are we even a church? We're just a club. The church, the church, the new Israel is God's people for proclaiming the excellency of the gospel. Wow, wow. To think that the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Moses, the God of Joseph and Joshua, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ values us enough that he takes his whole purpose in human history and says, okay, here you go, Rob. I'm putting it in your hands and if you fumble the ball, if you don't do anything, I'll let you finish that one. Let's make disciples. Let's reach out and teach all to follow Christ. I sure do love you folks. And if you've made it all the way through this series and even this lesson, thank you so much. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart and that God will open up avenues for you to brag on him. God bless you.